Hi, everyone. Just a reminder to start off um, that overnight, I think like two or three in the morning, uh, that we're going away from daylight savings time. So the clocks go back to Australian standard time or Eastern standard time. And so therefore, from next week, for those of you overseas, then uh, you should check, you should Google, <laughs> Google the time change or the time difference and then alter your schedule um, to suit with it. I think in the tropical, like near the equator, the countries there, um, I don't think they have daylight savings time. I think it's just the one time all year. Uh, but in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, we have this uh, daylight savings. Okay, so I think maybe uh, England, um, Europe, America, things like that, or USA, um, maybe you need to check and just to adjust, like I said, adjust your schedule for uh, participating in the class live. Of course, for those of you that participate by watching the video later, either on the YouTube channel or on Facebook, then it doesn't affect you at all. You can view it anytime you want. Okay, so don't view it when you're sleeping though. Otherwise you won't remember the teachings. Okay, so let's do the little bit of chanting. Just to remind you, we are doing the chanting very fast so that we get an extra minute or so to, uh, to talk later. Um, and in your own practice, uh, slow it down a little bit, okay? And the same with the meditations. We do short meditations. Uh, which we, uh, most of the time, we always do that, you know, nine times out of 10 at least or more. And um, in your own practice, in your own time, do them for longer, okay? So maybe even some more details, stay on the details. You know, for instance, in the uh, love and kindness meditation, to stay on the details, each, uh, each specific detail a little bit longer, okay? Now forget everything I just said. Namo tasa bhagavatu arahatu samasa buddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavatu arahatu samasa buddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavatu arahatu samasa buddhasa. Uttam saranam gachami, tamam saranam gachami, sangham saranam gachami, dutiyampi buddham saranam gachami, dutiyampi dhammam saranam gachami, dutiyampi sangham saranam gachami, tatiyampi buddham saranam gachami, tatiyampi dhammam saranam gachami, tatiyampi sangham saranam gachami, namo guru, namo buddhaya, namo donai, namo sangai, namo yidam, namo kandro. Oh, I did the longer one. Um, there's actually, I, I, maybe I can explain this to you now, even though we're doing the chanting that uh, in the Tibetan tradition, actually they take refuge in six jewels, um, but that they all fit really within the three jewels of Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And in my own practice, when I do the Vajrayana practice, it's Namo Gurube, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharma, Namo Sangha, Namo Yidam, Namo Kandro. I won't give explanation of that, but I just made that mistake just then. Okay, so now we just do what we normally do. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six parameters, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six parameters, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six parameters, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they never be parted from the happiness beyond suffering. May they abide in equanimity free of bias, attachment to the near and aversion from the far. I shall cause this. Great compassionate Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech and mind and present clouds of every types of offerings, actual and mentally transformed. I confess all of my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in all the virtues of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until cyclic existence ends and turn the wheel of Dharma for all sentient beings. I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. However innumerable all sentient beings are about to save them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are about to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are about to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is about to follow it completely. 
ओम मनी भद्र में हूं ओम मनी भद्र में हूं ओम मनी भद्र में हूं तया तो उंगते गते फारा गते फारा संगते बोले सो तया तो उंगते गते फारा गते फारा संगते बोले सो तया तो उंगते गते फारा गते फारा संगते बोले सो so i will actually explain slightly what i was mentioning before just so that you're not left sort of hanging there with curious mind um in the vajrayana tradition as you may know uh, lots of mantras are used um and uh, lots of visualization and uh, basically without going into you know any in depth whatsoever really um just that prayer I've shortened it. The the longer one that I used to chant, and they do chant in Tibetan, um, actually mentions more. Um, so not not just Namo Buddhaya, for instance, but like something to do with uh, I take refuge in the uh, immaculate, you know, the supremely enlightened Buddhas, like that. Okay, so it's similar, but these I shortened it for my own practice. Um, and uh, the only word I'm using in Tibetan is Yidam. and um the other words uh or oh, ankandro okay the other words actually kandro uh, in sanskrit is dharmapala which means dharma protector or protectors and um yidam in tibetan means like meditation deity it's so it's the actual focus it's the visualization um what you're visualizing let's say for instance it is sakyamuni buddha or buddha gautama then um then you uh, your yidam is sakimuni buddha okay if it's a, say a bodhisattva like a valakshara then your yidam uh, in in your focus in your practice to do with compassion for instance um is a valakshara now there could be you know different types of images one tibetan image has got four arms you know uh, each one holding something different and so basically you know this is symbolic of wisdom compassion and and other qualities as well and so um a thousand armed uh, volagishvara with 11 heads you know all of these details the more details that you have to um visualize and focus on maybe uh, actually is um more uh, you could say the beginner's practice in a sense it's not but uh, it's kind of it's not totally advanced in the sense okay so the more you have to, more details you have to memorize and um, visualize then actually um you could say that uh, helps you to focus more you know um then of course they have more simple um deities as well okay so that's uh, without going into any detail really okay so the you go namo gurube which means i i take refuge in the guru or your teacher you know um then it's the namo buddhaya namo dharmaya namo sangaya slightly different order um in the tibetan prayer um and then namo yidam namo kandro so the meditation deity in kandro means take also take refuge in dharma protectors so bodhisattvas and the like that protect dharma practitioners along the way of course the the ultimate protection is your own practice okay all has to do with your mind everything i just mentioned it has to do with your mind and this is not just vajrayana this is all buddhism the buddha taught us to purify the mind and he taught many many different types of techniques and different levels because we're all different we all um need to have certain practices um for us individually collectively as well um uh, but also we need different we have different sort of levels of um intellect different levels of mental stability and clarity and so forth so the buddha taught many ways uh to lead us uh to what we call enlightenment okay so i just thought i would add to that there and once again i will remind you to forget everything i just said and we will do the meditation now okay so bring your mind inside your body or first of all get yourself comfortable and then your mind inside your body and we will release the tension from inside the body starting from the bottom of the body working way up to the top and once you've done this you just scan your body quickly once more to see if there's any leftover tension that you can release and then do so if there is
And now bring your mind to your breathing or the feeling of the breath as you breathe in your nose all the way into your lungs and then out your nose again, breathing in, breathing out. Focus on the breath. If your mind wanders away from the breath, then recognize that, be aware of that, and then be mindful of that. So aware if it wanders away, be mindful to put it back on the breath and conscientiously do, do that. So if your mind gets thoughts, any mental activity whatsoever, let it go by replacing your mind back onto your breath. And if your mind becomes dull or sleepy, then place your mind back onto your breath more brightly. You can also add the extra technique of counting the breaths. One in breath, one out breath is one and so on. Don't count past 10. And if you get distracted on the way to counting towards 10, then go back to one at that time. So let's practice like this in silence for a little bit. Now we can feel pleased with ourselves and fill ourselves with universal love and kindness. Utilize the visualization, filling ourselves with white light or nectar. Which represents universal love and kindness. Or if you find that difficult or don't want to do that, then just go with the feeling of universal love and kindness. Fill yourself with so much universal love and kindness that now overflows and radiates outwards, initially to your loved ones, family and friends, filling them with the universal love and kindness. 
wishing that they are happy, free from suffering, and are peaceful. And you can visualize that they are. So if you are utilizing the light or nectar, it radiates outwards from your heart center into their heart center and fills them with the universal love and kindness too. Now also include those you're indifferent towards, may regard as strangers, whether you know them a little or not at all. Fill them with the universal love and kindness and also wish that they are happy, free from suffering and are peaceful. Now also include those you may regard as enemies, radiating this love and kindness to them, filling them with the universal love and kindness. May they also be happy, free from suffering and be peaceful. And now you can extend the love and kindness out further and further distance wise, initially around your immediate area, could be around your house or your garden, up to you. Or you could have a sort of a larger area, maybe the local park or things like that. You know. Love and kindness going everywhere. And now radiate the love and kindness out throughout your whole state or county to all the living beings, whether you know about them or not and other states and counties throughout your whole country. And all of the countries throughout the world, as well as throughout all of the oceans and bodies of water, all the way down to the core of the earth and to the outermost atmosphere. Now your loving kindness also pervades throughout the whole solar system. the whole galaxy, the whole universe, and beyond. So your love and kindness pervades throughout infinite space. Also be present here and now to recite the dedication prayer. Due to this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of the Buddha, so that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious bodhicitta, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And may the precious view of shunyata, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. I'll just add to what I said a bit earlier as well. Uh, remember that these techniques the Buddha taught for us to, you know, the methods, for us to purify the mind, okay? The mind is, when we behold the mind, when we understand the mind, this includes all practices, whether we call them advanced or beginners or whatever, okay? The mind is what we're training. And so the mind, when we behold the mind, this is the ultimate practice, isn't it? When we understand the true nature of the mind the empty nature of the mind or Buddha nature or whatever you want to call it, okay? And so when you are engaging in the, say, for instance, like I mentioned before, the Vajrayana practice or Tantra practice, then actually um, all of this is empty. So the visualization actually is empty. The thought, thought of the Buddha, for instance, is empty. It's also impermanent. And eventually, because it's still within samsara, this is still methods, it's also unsatisfactory. Three marks of existence again. Impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and no self. Or in this case, emptiness of self. Of course, nirvana, enlightenment is beyond all of that, free from all of that. Now, the mantra, you know, very powerful mantras, some of them, or all of them, really. And of course, the power is really within your practice. Compassion is the true power because this is based on wisdom ultimately. And But this is also empty. So the mantra is empty. Your body is empty. And if, if you're engaging in the mudras, you know, um, the these are all empty. Okay. Just be aware of that. 
Of course, to us right now, it's kind of like an abstract idea, isn't it? Or some sort of concept still within dualistic thinking. Okay, so, but we have to use it. We have to use what we have right now to be able to work our way beyond it, to penetrate it, work our way beyond it. So I just wanted to add that, okay? So all of the practice that we do, it's very helpful. It's very, it's, it's meaningful. You we're working our way to purifying the mind, unveiling our true nature eventually. Okay, so, but it's all empty. So why, why would we get upset with ourselves? Why would we get upset with others when it's all empty? Because of our habits. That's the reason we have these mental afflictions. You know? So um, I'll just share this with you as well. You know, you may have seen some images um, in the Vajrayana tradition. Either on, you know, images on Buddha statues or tankas, sort of the, you know, like the like this tanka up here. Um, this is Amitabha Buddha in the center there. I know it's not very clear, but um, in the in the actual meditation position with the Virashana Buddha uh, mudra. Okay, so but anyway, um, you can see that there's some beautiful ones. Okay, then there is some ones that are actually in sexual union, male and female. This has got nothing to do with sex, okay? This actually is a Tibetan image called Yabyum, uh, which actually is the same as the Chinese yin and yang, okay? Male and female, okay? The two opposites come together to make the whole, okay? So it gets your attention though, doesn't it? So for people to have strong desires like that, you know, strong attachment, um, especially to um, the opposite sex or the, some some people the same sex, for instance, you know, whatever. When you have strong desires, when you have strong attachment like this, then um, these, these images get your attention. And so then, therefore, in the long run, help you to give up and let go of all of these attachments. Then you have the really scary ones, you know, um, maybe many heads and things like that. Um, and they actually... Um, are good for people that have a lot of anger and hatred because you're kind of faced with um, your anger, really, you know, this, this image. And then, of course, you, the beautiful ones are uh, for people that uh, have a lot of ignorance, delusion, you know, very attracted to this and attracted to that and whatever. Okay, so, um, so the, you have the three different types of images that you would visualise, really scary ones, malevolent ones, um, then the ones in sexual union, like I said, though, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with balancing the mind. Okay. And then, of course, you have the very beautiful ones, you know. So, um, therefore, specific purposes. Um, so, there's nothing within the images, nothing within Buddhism that isn't there to help us to uproot ignorance, to purify our mind, realize the supreme wisdom, and realize the bodhicitta great compassion and love and kindness, okay? So I just wanted to add to that. Um, it's a little bit to do what I was talking about today anyway. Um, of course, this uh, discussion we've had so far today came because I made a mistake in the chanting. See, make a mistake, turn it into a teaching. It's a good thing. All right, so um, this one today is about um, don't seek happiness from outside. Look within your own mind, okay? And so... Everything I've been talking about so far is related to this. Um, there is, as I say often, there is a method to my madness. As Even if it looks like I'm digressing a little bit, it's actually all related um, to this teaching. So the actual, um, in the book, as you know, we're um, addressing the questions, utilizing the book. Uh, we're up to uh, quote uh, number 43 and explanation number 43 out of 50. Don't seek happiness from outside. Look within your own mind. The explanation is, we can never find true lasting happiness in outside phenomena that is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and without lasting substance. Nor can we find it by continually seeking to gratify and satisfy our sense desires and our egocentric self. But if we purify our minds of ignorance, attachment, and aversion, and all of the other mental afflictions that these three poisons give rise to, as well as develop virtuous mental qualities, such as compassion, loving kindness, generosity, morality, patience, and the other virtuous far-reaching attitudes based on true wisdom, then we will naturally be contented and at peace with ourselves 
and all that surrounds us. We will be naturally happy and uh, work our way towards the supreme enlightenment because we are um, developing the good qualities, you know, adopting them, developing, perfecting them eventually, and and also purifying our mind from the ignorance, attachment, and aversion, and all of the other mental afflictions that arise due to these three poisons, okay, or three poisonous attitudes. Um, how can we find happiness from outside? You know, it's like the idea of getting enlightened from outside. How is it possible? You know, we're relying upon someone else or something else to what? Be happy? Get a new car. Yep, happy for a little while. Yeah, I used to like the smell of new cars when I first started driving. Um, and maybe I got in someone else's car. It was new. Um, but it goes away, doesn't it? What happens if you're so attached to your new car and then somebody scratches it or bumps it, get upset? But we, how can we find happiness in those things? We can find a little bit of happiness, but the actual real happiness is within our own mind. You know, it's not in the outside phenomena. Maybe you like to play piano. Maybe you like to play violin, maybe guitar, any musical instrument. But it's not the music that makes you happy. This is something inside your mind. Okay. And now, of course, if it's temporary happiness, then this is related to attachment, getting what you want. Aversion, not getting what you don't want, you know, but can't always guarantee it's going to be like that. Often we get what we don't want. Often we don't get what we want. And then it upsets our mind, create the karma and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so I mentioned once again, the three marks of existence in this, um, in this um, article, I actually uh, say impermanent, unsatisfactory and without lasting substance which means emptiness of self. Just a different way to put it, okay? No substantial reality. Nothing hard, you know, nothing firm, nothing unchanging. Okay, so that's all phenomena is like that. Like I mentioned just then, the new car goes old. As soon as you drive, actually, you know, if you buy a new car, I don't know how much they cost, uh, but let's say $30,000 or whatever, or pounds. Then as soon as you drive it off, the car yard, or drive it out of the car yard, it loses value. I don't know if you know that. Because if you try to resell it, even if you've only driven it 20 meters, if you try to resell it, you can never resell it for the same price. Or if you trick someone, maybe you can. But basically, that's, that's the truth. So um, this $30,000 we just spent um, and has now turned maybe into 29000 Okay, <laughs> So whatever. Okay, so you, I think you understand my examples, okay? It's changing all the time, things changing all the time, outside stuff changing all the time. Our mind, because not enlightened, is changing all the time. The untrained mind is said to move 65 times. That means it's creating karmas of all different intensities um, and heaviness or lightness 65 times every moment. Amazing, isn't it? Of course, we train our minds, maybe less. Okay, so, and then eventually not at all. Okay. Um, unsatisfactory, of course, even if you just look at it from the point of view of impermanence, you get what you want. Yeah, it's fantastic, but it's changing. That's unsatisfactory. Yes. Um, but also, you know, we create this unsatisfactoriness. This is the result. And even in the impermanence and the conditions that we live with, um, this is a result of our karmas, you know, all coming together with the heaviest karmas ripening first and then the lighter ones maybe later, maybe the lighter ones condition, the conditions that we have created with the heavier karmas, you know. And so we have this. This is unsatisfactory. and But it's without lasting self. If it wasn't without lasting self or lasting substance, then actually we could never change it. But the fact that there is no self, there is no cause, there is no effect, all interdependent, all empty of independence. This means that we actually can attain enlightenment. We can purify all of this, all of these karmas, all of these mental afflictions. Okay, so um, nor can we find it by continually seeking to gratify and satisfy our sense desires and our egocentric self. Now, egocentric self, you could say, is another way to put ignorance, okay, attachment to self. 
uh, ego like that. Um, and then, of course, the other ones that satisfy all of our senses. We have um, what we call the 12 ayutanas, and this is the six sense doors or six senses, and coming having a contact there with the sense objects. So let's say, for instance, we see something, our ability to see, our seeing, uh, this is the a sense door. And then we have outside phenomena, visual things, like this computer, for instance. Um, this is the sense object. We hear something. Maybe right now you're hearing my voice through the computer. To you, you're hearing. Then you are hearing the voice. <laughs> okay. And uh, this is actually the sense object. And, of course, with taste, we taste something, and then let's say it's food, for instance, and we have the experience like that. And the smell, same thing. Okay, then a touch, you know, tactile sensation, you know. Then, um, then of course, the mind. The mind is the consciousness and the other scanners and um, the objects or the... Um, yeah, you can say the objects of the mind, things like thoughts and conceptions, perceptions, and so on. Okay. 12 ayatanas uh, become the 18 datus or realms uh, when they come together. And then there's a conscious moment. Then you have the engage with the eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, or tactile sensation consciousness, and then mind consciousness. Okay, so in a sense, I'm kind of reminding you the teachings that uh, we had a couple of years ago, um, or maybe three years ago, I think now, on the five skandhas. Okay, so five skandhas are the form, which is our physicality, and then the mentality, which includes feelings or sensations. Perception, we can also use the other words like conceptions and uh, the first thought, noting, recognizing, so on. But when you give commentary, I find that the word perception is the best. And then you have the mental formations, or what I like to call um, habitual um, impulsive mental reactions. Okay, And this has two aspects uh, to it. Uh, from the past, the mental formations from the past, and also our intentions in the present, you know, creating the karma in, in that sense. And then we have the consciousness. Okay. Um, so what did I write down here? So I've spoken about like impermanence, suffering, or in unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. These are known as the three marks of existence. And then added when you have nirvana has been freedom from this and um, is the four seals, okay? Uh, this is specifically answering certain questions, okay, without going into too much details, too many details. So that's the 18 datus when the sense door comes into contact with the sense object and then you have a conscious moment a conscious contact there okay 18 datus 18 realms uh, then you have three poisons spoken about a little bit already the um, ignorance gives rise then to duality and attachment and aversion okay and then all of the other mental afflictions that come from these initially doubt pride and wrong views making the six root afflictions and then you have the secondary the 20 secondary afflictions and then giving rise to all of the other mental afflictions okay but if we can uh, purify the mind from these three then the other ones don't exist okay so it's in a sense it's hard the deep stuff um, deep teachings need to be understood and implemented, put into practice. But also, it's quite simple, isn't it? Only three of them. So that we purify the three of them, then uproot the three of them, then, of course, <laughs> the other ones don't come. So sounds easy too. The Dharma is very, the Buddha's teachings are very skillful, aren't they? Many levels, all at the same time. So the three poisons. Uh, also in this um, explanation, I mentioned the 
Uh, it says here, but if we purify our minds from ignorance, attachment and aversion, or all the other mental afflictions that these three poisons give rise to, as well as develop virtuous mental qualities, such as compassion and loving kindness. So this is talking about bodhicitta, okay, and the four immeasurables, putting that into practice. Also the seven, um, seven point cause and effect method or the seven point uh, method for developing bodhicitta, practicing these to develop the compassion um, and the, the relative bodhicitta to be married eventually, of course, with the with true wisdom. And then this is the ultimate bodhicitta. Um, also, I mentioned generosity, morality, patience, and the other virtuous far-reaching attitudes. So obviously, these are the six parameters of generosity or dana, morality or sila, patience or shanti. And the other uh, virtuous far-reaching attitudes are Virya, or enthusiastic perseverance or effort, uh, samandhi, concentration, and prajna, of course, wisdom. Okay, um, based on true wisdom, the prajna, then we will naturally be contented and at peace with ourselves and all that surrounds us. We will be naturally happy. Now, I'm talking about temporary happiness in a sense, but really the happiness of enlightenment. The maha sukha. Sukha means happy or joy or bliss. And maha means great. And this is achieved when we realize enlightenment. Okay. Along the way, of course, we have the, the smaller blisses, if you could say, the result of our good karma along the way, can, and also the conditions we create that we need on the Dharma path, um, the good ones, you know. So um, this is kind of like a kind of bliss while we're on the path, in a sense, okay? Um, what else did I write here? Four immeasurables, I've mentioned that before, uh, just to practice this, develop this. I won't go into any more details than that. I've mentioned the five skandhas and also um, the wisdom and compassion, okay? So I, the little notes there, I just so I didn't forget anything. Um, I thought I'd mention all of these things within this teaching today, even though I was actually going to wait um, uh, for another few weeks, um, but to do with another teaching. But I thought I mentioned them in this one because I got follow-up questions um, in relation to these uh, these um, subjects. Okay. So only a minute and a half to go. I'll reread it to you quickly. Don't seek happiness from outside. Look within your own mind. It's nice in there, you know. When you practice Dharma, it's nice in your mind. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid to look in there, even if you see faults. Fantastic to see faults, because then you can uproot them. You can purify them, replace them with the good qualities. We can never find true lasting happiness in outside phenomena that is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and without lasting substance. Nor can we find it by continually seeking to gratify and satisfy our sense desires and our egocentric self. But if we purify our minds of ignorance, attachment, and aversion, and all of the other mental afflictions that these three poisons give rise to, as well as develop virtuous mental qualities such as compassion, loving kindness, generosity, morality, patience, and the other virtuous far reaching attitudes based on true wisdom, then we will naturally be contented and at peace with ourselves and all that surrounds us. We will be naturally happy and I really wish that for you. Now and into the future, eventually the supreme happiness. Okay, so I rejoice in your goodness. Uh, remember the daylight savings finishing tonight. And... Yeah, rejoicing in your meritorious goodness as always. Study, practice, and share.